So many thanks for inviting me to this conference. I uh, had not uh, the opportunity to meet uh, uh, George Mosse, and I'm very honored to participate in this uh, conference. And this is also the reason uh, for which I will focus my paper on Mosse's uh, theory of uh, fascism. In this historical moment, and optimistically, I don't say in this age, shaped by Donald Trump, uh, Jair Bolsonaro, Viktor Orban, Marine Le Pen, Matteo Salvini, and uh, Alternative für Deutschland, uh, the study of fascism inevitably tends to cross the academic boundaries and to become once again a political commitment. In the 1970s, however, Moses' revolution in historicizing fascism consisted precisely in his capacity to overcome the limits of a historiography so deeply entangled with the public use of the past that its main purpose was stigmatizing, politically and morally, rather than critically understanding fascism. Writing as a German Jew exiled in the United States, he couldn't be suspected of any complicity or sympathy uh, when he wrote that uh, fascism had to be investigated from inside, taking seriously into account uh, its discourse and uh, self-representations, its symbols and ideology, and trying to penetrate the mental universe of its actors. This claim of empathy what in his autobiography depicts as the chief quality of a historian, a procedure that means putting contemporary prejudice aside while looking at the past without fear or favor, was quite unusual among historians of fascism. Reminiscent of uh, the historicist uh, Einfühlung, which implies a certain degree of comprehension. But Benjamin uh, uh, strongly rejected uh, it in his uh, famous uh, thesis on the concept of history. Empathy is a controversial concept, but uh, the liberating effects of Moss's approach were enormous. S a significant epistemological obstacle was removed and many previous debates on the lack of a fascist culture were suddenly eclipsed. The conventional approach of scholars such as Gordon Craig, for whom Nazi culture was an oxymoron, or Norberto Bobbio, who distinguished the Italian culture under fascism from fascist anti-culture, which he presented as a set of simple negations, anti-democracy, anti-liberalism, anti-communism, anti-humanism, and anti-enlightenment, was no longer defendable. According to Mosse, fascism was a vision of man and history, a project of society and civilization, a cultural and political revolution. This is, by the way, a strong difference with respect to the current right-wing uh, uh, right, uh, right uh, movements. It was a revolution since it aimed at rebuilding society as a whole. It was a world vision since it wished to create a new man and depicted itself as a providential destiny for race and nation. Uh, and it was a culture uh, uh, since it proclaimed its will to transform collective imaginations and the styles of life, as well as to erase any difference between public and private life. The components of fascist culture were diverse and heterogeneous. They included a romantic impulse and a national mysticism that uh, idealized uh, ancient traditions, often forging a mythical past. 
Fascist culture glorified values such as virility, race, youth, action, and struggle by translating them into rituals, emblems, and symbols that reshaped national identity. Mosse depicted fascism as a product of the nationalization of the masses, a process that started with the French Revolution and had been powerfully intensified and extended by the Great War. Differently from the 19th century liberal order that had despised the masses, fascism claimed their mobilization by giving them the illusion of no longer being passive spectators and having become actors of history. The nationalization of the masses meant, uh, meant an ensemble of uh, uh, collective rituals, nationalist rallies, the cult of martyrs, national festivals, monuments, flags, and songs that created a fascist liturgy well expressed by the speeches of Mussolini and Hitler. By transforming nationalism into a political religion provided with a coherent cultural and political form, fascism invented a new kind of modernity. Since it was the uh, French Revolution that, uh, by sacralizing its secular institutions, had created nationalism as a collective belief and forged a new relationship between aesthetics and politics, fascism was, according to Mosse, a direct descent from Jacobinism. It is known that uh, these uh, theses provoked a clash with uh, François Furet, for whom Jacobinism was rather the matrix of communism. There are no doubts that, uh, however controversial it was, Moss's empathic approach opened new perspectives and incited observing fascism through a completely different lens. His methodological change required an epistemic displacement that was quite exceptional for the intellectual generation that had experienced the years of fascism and the Second World War. Maybe one of the keys of his originality lies precisely in his relative indifference as Stephen Ashheim pointed out yesterday, to historiographical or theoretical debates. He followed his own path and never felt compelled to defend his innovations by criticizing canonical interpretations and dominant points of view. On the one hand, this allowed him to avoid scholarly inhibitions. On the other, however, this had some more than uh, negligible consequences. If blazing the path for a new exploration of fascism as a political, cultural, and aesthetic revolution had incontestably fruitful results, his general theory of fascism was not without certain aporias. Here, I would like to pay attention to some of them. Emphasizing the historical singularity of fascism as a coherent political phenomenon, Mosse frequently expressed his skepticism towards the theories of totalitarianism that put fascism and communism together as twin enemies of classical liberalism. He also criticized the Jacob Talmans uh, interpretation of totalitarianism, which grasped its roots in the Enlightenment, and more particularly in Rousseau's uh, uh, thought. According to Mosse, uh, the core of Jacobinism didn't lie in uh, the uh, Enlightenment, but rather in the nationalization of the masses, the uh, reinterpretation of nation as a civic religion, and the invention of a new liturgical political style made of festivals and rituals. Therefore, the most authentic inheritor of Jacobinism was not the socialist left, it was nationalism and finally fascism. 
Splitting Jacobinism from the Enlightenment, however, means recognizing that fascism was a genus head with two faces, one modern, nationalism, and one conservative, anti-enlightenment. Whereas its uh, political style was modern, its rejection of the values of equality, democracy, liberty, and a universal idea of man inscribed it into the ideological and political realm of reaction. It seems to me that uh, this statement inevitably introduced introduces some nuances and problematizes the concept of fascist revolution. The entire trajectory of fascism is encapsulated in anti-communism, an aggressive and violent anti-communism that transformed its political religion into a crusade against the Bolshevism and the Soviet Union. Viewed as a radical form of anti-communism, fascism loses its revolutionary dimension and appears as counter-revolution. Not the inheritor of Jacobinism, rather a secularized version of legitimism. We should not forget that in the late 1930s and early 40s, Karl Schmitt depicted Donoso Cortés as a forerunner of National Socialism. The self-representation of fascism as revolution, whose apogee was the celebration of the 10th anniversary of the March on Rome in 1932, cannot be separated from its irreducible antagonism with the communist revolution. Moss stressed that, in contrast with Bolshevism, the fascist revolution didn't have a social and economic content, but this was far from being their only difference. By historicizing fascism and Bolshevism, both the Spanish Civil War and the war on the Eastern Front between 1941 and 1945, appear as a crucial moment of a titanic confrontation between revolution and counter-revolution that deeply shaped the entire 20th century. Whereas his first book on Nazism, The Crisis of German Ideology, 1964, pointed out the origins of uh, folkish nationalism in a reactionary version of romanticism and a radical criticism of the Enlightenment, what yesterday Stephen Ashheim depicted as a substantial endorsement of the theory of the German Sonderweg. In the 1970s, Mosse discovered the link between fascism and Jacobinism and elaborated a, con a conception of fascist revolution that privileged its aesthetic and cultural forms, thus emphasizing quite unilaterally uh, its modern character. He never paid much attention to the definition of fascism as a, a narrator of the conservative revolution or an extreme form of reactionary modernism. This concept belongs to Jeffrey Herf. It is as a hybrid uh, and eclectic combination of conservative, conservatism and modernism, of faith and science, of reactionary values and futuristic myths, of romantic ideals and biological racism, of anti-enlightenment and cult of technology. In short, fascism as a cultural synthesis, according to uh, Anson Rabinbach's definition. Fascism certainly had abandoned uh, the cultural despair of the old European conservatism, but its modernism radically rejected the legacy of humanism, universalism, and the rights of man. Uh, Josef Goebbels, uh, who in his famous speech of May 1st, 1933, had announced the end of the era of the French Revolution, depicted National Socialism as a kind of steel romanticism, Stalatis Romantic. As a form of reactionary modernism, fascism was a result of the dialectic of enlightenment, 
It asked something more and something different than a direct descendant of Jacobinism. Differently than most scholars of totalitarianism, including Renzo de Felice in Italy, Mosse defended a general theory of fascism that refused to separate its Italian and German components. He didn't ignore the ideological discrepancies between these two forms of fascism, the Italian founded upon the idea of the state and the German upon the concept of race. Whereas Italian fascism aimed at building a totalitarian state, the Nazi juridical thinkers rejected the notion itself of totalitarianism and reduced the state to a simple tool of racial rule. Nevertheless, these discordances did not exclude a progressive convergence, particularly after the anti-Semitic turn of Italian fascism and the promulgation of its racial laws in 1938. Despite their ideological and cultural differences, the Italian valorization of the aesthetic avant-garde uh, didn't feed the Nazi rejection of degenerate art, fascism and national socialism belonged to the same political family. Not only do I agree with, with such assessment, but even would include Francoism in this heterogeneous category. Mosse's, Mosse did not. In his eyes, fascism was a revolutionary form of modernism and Francoism an extreme form of Catholic reaction. But there is a contradiction, uh, in my view, between the exclusion of Francoism from his theoretical model of fascism and the emphasis in his autobiography on the Spanish Civil War as the crucial event that pushed him towards anti-fascism. He never tried to historicize anti-fascism, which, according to his own definition, uh, he had experienced uh, as uh, a political and emotional commitment the ethos of his generation. The Spanish Civil War had affected him as a clash between fascism and anti-fascism, but Franco's clerical rituals left him quite indifferent. Sometimes Moses' empathetic perspective deeply influenced his comparisons. Quote, the Duce showed more human dimensions than the Führer, he wrote in the Fascist Revolution 2000, in order to explain that, quote, Mussolini had no Auschwitz. Whereas National Socialism had arisen from Völkisch ideology, Italian fascism, he stressed, had its roots in the more humanistic tradition of the Risorgimento. Some passages of his memoirs give a key to clarifying this complacency towards the Italian dictator. In 1936, when he was in Italy with his mother, Mussolini promised them his protection. He had not forgotten uh, the financial help that George's father had given him when he left the Socialist Party at the outbreak of the First World War. This episode, Mosse concluded, quote, throws light on Mussolini's character, at least upon his sense of gratitude. One could observe that in exactly the same year of 1936, uh, the dictator's letters and telegrams claiming and approving the gas bombings and the fascist massacres in Ethiopia equally throw light uh, on his personality. And it is highly improbable that an Ethiopian scholar could be touched by his human dimension. This stimulates other critical remarks on Moss's interpretation of fascism, notably its almost complete silence about colonialism. 
It is true that he elaborated his theory before the wave of post-colonial studies, but he didn't change his perspective during the 1980s and 1990s. His numerous essays on fascism do not include any substantial mention of the Ethiopian war or the Nazi war against the USSR as colonial wars for conquering the Italian and German vital space, Spazio Vitale, Lebensraum. His successful book toward the final solution, 1978, whose subtitle reads A History of European Racism, doesn't deal with the history of colonial racism. It even suggests that the concept of subhumanity, untermenschentum, was rarely used before 1914, skipping over its relevance during the Herero genocide in 1904, and also in broader terms, its trivialization in the lexicon of European colonialism. The literature on the lower uh, races could easily fill the shelves of entire libraries in several Western languages. This gap is all the more astonishing insofar as, since 1935, colonialism had played a very important role in fascist culture and aesthetics, to the point of becoming an obsessive reference in propaganda exhibitions, posters, monuments, architecture, movies, popular songs, including newspapers and street advertisements. But Mosse was far from being an exception. A similar disregard for colonialism distinguishes the ensemble of German culture in exile and also German Jewish culture in exile. Colonialism and imperialism are al almost inexistent entries in the collected works of Adorno, Horkheimer, Benjamin, Krakauer, Neumann, Kassirer, Löwit, and so on. The exceptions were Herbert Marcuse, especially during the Vietnam War, and Hannah Arendt for a very short moment uh, when she wrote uh, The Origins of Totalitarianism, 1951, a work that devotes an entire section to imperialism. For this intellectual generation, anti-Semitism was such a deep, devastating, and traumatic experience that it absorbed all their existential concerns and analytic efforts, thus eclipsing colonialism. It is significant that Moss's book on racism and his uh, uh, pioneering essay on fascism chronologically correspond with Edouard Said's Orientalism, 1978, the work that reinterpreted Western culture and literature through their symbiotic and conflicting relationship with the colonial world. This missed encounter between the German Jewish culture in exile and anti-colonialism was highly regrettable, especially taking into account the striking homologies between Edouard Said's concept of Orientalism and George Moss's idea of bourgeois normality and Sittlichkeit insofar as both of them needed a, dialectic, a dialectical opposite, a stigmatized otherness. According to Mosse, fascism built a physical and spiritual ideal of the new man that was rooted in a militaristic and aggressive vision of manliness, virility, and bodily strength. This ideal needed its countertypes, which he identified primarily with the Jew and the homosexual, respectively the anti-race and the symbol of an emasculated nation. But Mosse never mentioned the colonized subjects upon whose racial orderness was fixed a clear separation between rulers and ruled in both a mental and a geographical space. Analogously to the Nuremberg laws, 
uh, of uh, uh, 1935, the fascist laws of uh, uh, 1938 aimed at excluding the Jews from citizenship and the national community, but uh, their purpose was also to establish rigorous racial boundaries in the Italian empire. From this point of view, fascism simply de deepened uh, the political anthropology of colonialism that had been one of the sources of European nationalism since uh, the middle of the 19th century. Some topics are subjacent in Moss's work, works. In the last page of his memoirs, uh, he writes that, I quote, the Holocaust was never very far from uh, his mind adding that he was a member of the Holocaust generation and that he had constantly tried to understand an event too monstrous to contemplate. In fact, a book like Fallen, uh, um, uh, Fallen Soldiers, 1990, is a decisive contribution to the analysis of the historical premises of the Holocaust by devoting many chapters to the advent of industrial massacre, the tri uh, trivialization of mass death, the advent of mass anonymous death, and the brutalization of politics engendered by the Great War. Nonetheless, it doesn't seem to me that colonialism could be likewise considered as a hidden dimension of his work. I focus on colonialism because I'm convinced that uh, this legacy of fascism is very relevant today. European nationalism had two pillars. The first was anti-Semitism, and the second was colonialism. If we try to sketch a genealogy of uh, contemporary right-wing populism or uh, post-fascism, we observe that uh, with a few exceptions, for example, for instance, uh, Viktor Orban, it tends to abandon the first and to endorse the second. Today, racism and xenophobia are mostly directed against immigrants, refugees, and Muslims who come from the former European colonies. And I conclude now. Mosse highly contrib contributed to conceptualize fascism by forging analytical categories such as fascist revolution, the nationalization of the masses, the brutalization of politics, sexual conformity, and the contrast between Bildung and uh, Sittlichkeit. 20 years after his death, his work doesn't need to be discovered or rediscovered. It has been canonized. Mosse has become a classic and is recognized as one of the greatest historians of the 20th century. His concepts, theses, and paradigms have inspired a generation of scholars that, had, that uh, has analyzed the fascist and Nazi culture in all its dimensions. I certainly wouldn't say that everything has been said on these topics, but my impression is that the historiographical renewal of the most recent years has come back to some of the aspects of fascism that he usually neglected, thus merging uh, culture with economy and politics. 20 years after his death, the magnitude of his intellectual and scholarly innovation is self-evident, and in his own spirit, his work deserves empathetic criticism rather than pure celebration. Thank you.